WFYI podcasts are brought to you by Visit Bloomington. With over 350 restaurants to choose from, Bloomington, Indiana is truly a food lover's paradise. Go to visitbloomington.com to discover what suits your taste. This is WFYI News Now. It's February 21st, and I'm Darian Benson. On today's show, testimony on the bill Indigo says would kill the proposed blue line. Abuse victims who are part of a settlement with the Boy Scouts could get access to more money, and obstetric units are struggling, especially in rural areas, and that's led many of them to close. But some are surviving and even thriving. We built it up based on availability, getting patients in, treating patients like incredibly well, like just what how you'd want to be treated and not making it such a system thing. Those stories coming up, but first... Indianapolis's Planned Economic Enhancement District, or EED, will not be repealed. As Jill Sheridan reports, a bill puts the funding tool at risk, but an amendment saves the district, with some caveats. The EED was approved by the City County Council last year after 2023 legislation allowed the move. It charges a fee for property owners in the Miles Square to support public safety, beautification, and homelessness projects. Representative Julie McGuire authored the bill and says the city didn't need the tool. If Indianapolis believes the enhanced services provided with the ARPA funds are worthy to continue, they have the tools they need to provide this funding. Under an amendment, renters and apartment buildings can opt out of the EED. Senator Andrea Hunley says she's glad it will move forward. I'm hoping that the majority of multi-unit housing will choose to opt in, um, as several that I've talked to seem to indicate that they would. The EED would provide about $5.5 million a year and also support Indianapolis's first low-barrier shelter. I'm Jill Sheridan. A House committee yesterday heard testimony on a bill to put a moratorium on dedicated bus lanes. As Ben Thorpe reports, Indigo officials say the bill will kill the proposed Blue Line, the city's third bus rapid transit system. Bill sponsor Senator Aaron Freeman has maintained that his legislation is only intended to study the issue of dedicated lanes. But during the committee, Freeman told lawmakers that dedicated lanes were outdated. I think fixed modes of transportation, uh, especially in a dedicated lane situation, is not the way of the future. Indigo interim CEO Jennifer Piers said federal officials have made clear that even a one-year delay would likely scuttle access to federal funding for the project. And so this bill would effectively kill the blue line. The bill was held in committee and is expected to receive a vote next week. I'm Ben Thorpe. And another story out of the State House. Several hundred abuse victims who are part of a large settlement with the Boy Scouts of America could get access to more money under a bill approved by a Senate committee yesterday. Brandon Smith reports the bill temporarily extends the statute of limitations only for those victims. Under the settlement that stems from abuse claims that go back decades, victims can choose to get a small payment immediately, can go forward with individual claims, or get their payment amount determined by a system that takes into account several factors, one of which is whether the state statute of limitations has run out on their claims. Mike Faust says Indiana's strict statute of limitations means he and other victims in the settlement could get 10 to 25 percent less than victims in other states. To these men, and yes, to me personally, it will be like getting abused all over again. It will hurt that much. The bill lifts the statute of limitations only for those victims in the settlement until 2025. A Senate committee unanimously advanced the measure to the full Senate. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Brandon Smith at the State House. And for our final story today, more and more rural hospitals across the country have stopped delivering babies in recent years. Hospitals say that's due to many factors. It's harder to recruit staff like OBGYNs. Insurance also reimburses hospitals so little for deliveries, and overall, people are having less babies. This means those who are pregnant in rural areas have to drive further for care and delivery. This affects their health and safety. But as Natalie Krebs reports, some rural hospitals have found ways to make these units survive. Jen Muse steps around construction equipment into a brand new labor and delivery room at Iowa Specialty Hospital in Clarion, Iowa. This is gonna be the infant resuscitation area. So every room will have its own warmer uh, ability to resuscitate um, the baby uh, in here as well. Muse oversees the hospital's OB unit. 
She says the expansion is long overdue. Iowa Specialty delivered nearly 600 babies last year. It's an insanely high number of births for a town that has less than 3,000 people. When construction is complete, eight of the hospital's 25 beds will be dedicated to labor and delivery. That bed management is still going to be sometimes a little tricky, even with eight. But hopefully, we can make it work. At a time when many rural hospitals are making the tough choice to stop delivering babies, Iowa Specialty's OB unit is thriving. The reason is due in part to Iowa Specialty's partnership with maternal care clinics in neighboring small towns. Local OBGYN Daniel Gabrielson started these partnerships more than two decades ago. Gabrielson says he wanted to make sure women had local, more personalized care than they'd get at a bigger hospital. We built it up based on availability, getting patients in, treating patients like incredibly well, like just what how you'd want to be treated and not making it such a system thing. This personal treatment is what brought Corinne Tudor back to Clarion on a recent snowy winter day. She lives in Webster City, a small town about a half hour south where the local hospital closed its labor and delivery unit in 2018. She got all her prenatal care at Dr. Gabrielson's local clinic there. And then she's come to Iowa Specialty to deliver the baby. They're personal. They get to know you and check everything and make sure everything's okay and you're comfortable and just make sure everything's good. Other rural hospitals are finding ways to make its labor and delivery unit work. A recent study surveyed rural hospital administrators nationwide and found they reported needing about 200 births per year in order to break even financially and make sure doctors were getting adequate experience for safety reasons. But the study found more than a third of rural hospitals continued to deliver babies, even though they were below the break-even threshold. The researchers asked the administrators why. And they said because our community needs it. Katie bacchus Cosimonal is with the University of Minnesota's Rural Health Research Center and is the lead author on the study. That was so striking to me, and it makes me think that there need to be some policy changes to make that more feasible when there are hospitals trying to serve their local patient populations and are struggling to do so. Floyd Valley Healthcare in Lamar's, Iowa, is a good example of what bacchus Cosimonal's study found. The rural hospital in northwestern Iowa is remodeling its unit to expand and update its decades-old rooms. Tara Geddes is the chief nursing officer at the hospital. She says they found people were interested in going to a smaller hospital like Floyd Valley to give birth, but they didn't like its older facilities and small rooms. We're having more individuals or more families that want to deliver in that smaller kind of more personal care approach instead of going to the tertiary hospitals where they're just, it's so busy. Geddes says Floyd Valley hopes to increase births by around 50 percent. If they deliver, they're coming through our clinics, they have our providers, their families are coming through, and so they just recognize Floyd Valley as being the place that they can get all of their care. She says the hospital still doesn't expect the unit to be profitable, but sees labor and delivery as one way to bring in more patients. Natalie Krebs, Side Effects Public Media. That's all for today's episode of WFYI News Now. Our podcast is produced by the following people who live in your community. Aubriana Heron, Drew Doblin, Kendall Antron, who composed the music for this podcast, and me, Darian Benson. Our news director is Sarah Neil Estes. If you liked today's episode, remember to subscribe and share. And follow WFYI on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube to check in on our newsroom throughout the day. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow.